All right, so welcome. Um, what we're going to do is going over the first lecture and the first part of the book. And I'm going to give you an overview of kind of what to expect and uh, what is this particular um, subdiscipline of philosophy, which is called metaphysics. Now, metaphysics um, is actually per personally one of my favorite and where I work, like to work at a lot, it's really, you could summarize metaphysics as understanding um, questions regarding reality. So what is real, what exists, what can exist, what is possible in this universe, things like that. And this is where Gannett starts off the textbook. This is part one. She wants to start right at the groundwork of what is reality. And what we're going to talk about is Plato's Allegory of the Cave and why that story that you're reading is so important, especially with regards to metaphysics. And it touches on a no number of things as well. And this is where some of the other articles in the book uh, particularly discuss. So the way that Gannett has arranged this um, I guess textbook is that it's kind of what I liked about it a lot and why I chose this textbook is that it's so not like a typical textbook. Uh, how is that? Because it gives you an overview. That's what a typical textbook and intro of philosophy would do, but it does focus on the real voices of the individuals writing it rather than just giving you uh, a bunch of terms to memorize or tiny quizzes, you're actually really engaging and thinking about what these people have to say in their lives. So a number of issues that uh, particular philosophers are talking about in this book uh, refer to personal identity, you know, what makes you you, uh, freedom and determinism, uh, are you in control of your own actions, uh, do you get a say in uh, where your direction is in life, is it already predetermined, which is a possibility you should think about. You know, were you always destined to sign up for this class? Uh, was this something that uh, was gonna take place as soon as you were born, you know, and all the pieces were just falling into place? Or is this something that you chose? Um, natural and social kinds, which we'll get into a little bit. Uh, natural kinds are categories of things that nature determines what this category versus social kinds where we determine what's part of this category or not. And we're going to see, you know, a lot of things in particular with related to race. Is race a social kind or a natural kind? Is it something that we're born into or is it something that society determines? So these are some of the topics that we're going to talk about. Now, if you take a look, what metaphysics really means if you break down the word, and this is going to hopefully help you understand uh, what this section of the book is talking about, is that meta means beyond. You can, when somebody says uh, something is meta, uh, they're taking kind of a step back from what they're talking about, kind of looking at it from the outside. So, you know, if it was a house, you know, a meta step outside of the house would be I'm sitting outside of the house and I'm looking at the whole thing rather than just trying to figure it out from the inside, right? And so take that analogy, and this is what we're going to talk about with topics and concepts. We want to kind of take a step back and look at the whole thing. So metaphysics, and metaphysics is something that was started by Aristotle, which is Plato's, a student of Plato, even though they totally disagree with each other, and you know, I'll explain a little bit maybe of that later, but um, metaphysics was to was a way to have discussions about something that physics couldn't cover. So Aristotle, he wrote a lot about physics. Um, he wrote the first book on physics actually, and he said, "Well, wait a minute, he had some bigger questions." that weren't really covered in his physics book. Say, so, well, wait a minute, what's beyond physics? What do you mean bigger than what's covered in physics? And the type of questions and things he wondered about 
was things like causation. Okay, so we'll talk about cause and effect, that this physical thing pushes against another physical thing, it makes it fall over, gravity, stuff like that. But then he, this is something even contemporary physics can't tell you much about, and this is the realm of metaphysics, is, well, how do you know something causes something else? What is causation by itself? Not when I give an example of it, but what does it mean to say something caused something else? Space and time. Well, I say, well, it happens in space and time. Well, this is even something, this is where it gets deeply philosophical sometimes, a lot in physics, is that, well, what do we mean by space and time? For maybe space-time warps and things like that, but, you know, where is this concept of time, though? How do we know we're talking about time in physics? Is that different from how we experience time with ourselves? Is it the same kind of time? So it gets, a, it gets very deep. Things beyond physics. Things like God. So God is supposed to be beyond everything. Beyond space and time, right? So what does that mean? How does something exist beyond space and time? Outside of space and time? You know, does time affect God? Does it not? Those are deep, uh, larger metaphysical questions. Identity. What makes God that being? What makes you that particular being? This is where we get issues about personal identity. And reality beyond the sensory experience. So this is why metaphysics is a little bit weird to kind of wrap your head around is that it's talking about stuff that's really hard to see, right? How do you see space itself? How do you see time itself? How do you see causation? How do you see God? These are things that can be really difficult to try to see with your eyes and experience you know physically this is why it's beyond physics and presuppositions of scientific theories and this is where i've worked a lot with is that well i say well science gives us all the answers well science makes us some assumptions before it gives us those answers so what kind of assumptions do the scientists make you know like i said it's kind of assuming that something is physical in order for us to give a scientific explanation. But what about things that are, we don't consider necessarily physical, like God? Can it give us answers about those things? And universals and particulars. Now, universals and particulars is where we even get maybe even more abstract. Um, a universal is something like a category, like I was talking about right now with the natural kind. It's some sort of like, there's a particular, and I'll give you an example here, there's a cup, and that's a particular cup, this individual cup. I can hold it, I can pick it up, I can drop it, break it. But universals would be uh, a cup in the sense of like, well, I know what a cup is, even if I don't, not talking about that particular cup, I know what cups are in general. So you see how that becomes a little bit more abstract. And so questions about reality itself, and what we're really studying here in metaphysics is what is the nature of something to exist? How do we understand its being, the object itself? And that's what we talk about when we talk about ontology. The nature, we're studying the nature of it. You know, what is it made out of? How, does it hold space? Uh, the cup is empty right now. Does that mean that the cup, the cup is containing space? Does it mean it's containing time? Those are types of questions that we talk about when we're talking about something like ontology. So what exists? How does it exist? And what is the nature or essence of something? You know, what does it mean to be a cup? Does it have to be this color? Does it have to be this shape? Can it be a different shape? Can it be a different color? Well, if you're saying yes, then that's, you have an idea of a universal, something that uh, we have this category cup, and it, we're not talking about any particular cup. So, of course, when we're talking about metaphysics and what I was talking about right now, you know, it goes beyond the laws of physics. So, it might be true that space and time warp, like Einstein had proposed in his theories of special and general relativity. So, if space and time warp, 
could that have, does that have to be the case in every universe, right? Is that something that any possible universe out there uh, would have? Um, could there have been a different universe where space and time and gravity doesn't work like it does here? Um, how do we know those worlds are possible or not? Those are, again, what we would call uh, metaphysical possibilities or um, thematically impossible worlds. We're saying, well, in no world it's possible. No way that's going to exist. So nomos, coming from the Greek word law, is saying that, well, is that laws, if it is that particular set of laws, you know, possible or not? So possible worlds is a really good way that we as philosophers think about necessity and contingency. So necessity meaning that it has to be the case. It's necessarily true. There's no other way it could have happened. Versus contingently. Well, it's possible that it was true. It doesn't have to be that way. So when I say something is necessarily true, right, it means that it's true in every world. So no matter what universe you pick, it's going to be the same. Now, if I say it's necessarily false, that means that no universe out there is it ever going to be true. And then contingently means that, well, in some of the universes it might be true, and other universes, well, it's not true. So some universes have gravity, other universes don't have gravity. Is that a necessary truth? Is that a contingent truth? Those are the kind of things that we debate about in metaphysics. So where would the laws of physics fit, right? Is it something that's necessarily true, necessarily false, contingently? Those are hard question, metaphysical questions. And this is where we get into mathematics, because you could have said, well, wait a minute. Well, something that I know has to be true is that 2 plus 2 equals 4. No matter what universe you're in, it has to be the same. Now notice, if I'm talking about a mathematical truth, that is something like, let's say, the number 9 exists. Well, if I say that's always true, then does that mean it's true even if no human being is in that universe? Would it still be true? And the 9 exists, or that 2 plus 2 equals 4. It would always be true. So, or 5 plus 4 equals 9. Is that true in all possible worlds? These are the type of questions that we talk about in the metaphysics of mathematics. And notice that these aren't really scientific questions, either are they? Because we're doing math, we're not doing science. Now, science uses math, right? But math can do its own thing. It's not doesn't have to do the exact same thing science does. So notice the laws of physics don't really affect math. Right? So no matter how physical uh, the how physically the world or the universe is put together, um, math doesn't change. Five plus four doesn't equal another number other than nine because you know, the laws change to physical gravity changes or something like that. So, again, ways of thinking about contingency and possibility. What's possible? What is, has to be true? What has to be false? What could be true? You know, where would math fit? Is it something that's going to be true or the same in all universes? Uh, or does it change? In different universes? These are big questions. And now this is where I get to some of my favorite stuff and we're going to get more in depth into uh, with the readings um, for this week and next week. Identity. So what makes you you? I mentioned that, right? So you see a lot of these shows, I think, uh, where they restore cars. They, they take a car uh, something that's kind of beat up like this truck on the left hand side and then they try to say okay well wait a minute uh, can we put it together and make it 
and just remodel it so it's something like on the right hand side. Now I use Theseus. Theseus is a very famous uh, philosophical story about a ship, but I kind of try to make it a little bit modern, so I'm making a joke here about a, a used car instead of a ship. So let's say we have this case where um, you have this beat up old uh, truck, the engine is missing, obviously. You look at the one on the left hand side, there's only the wheels and a frame. Is it the same truck once it's remodeled and it looks like the truck on the right hand side? Can we say it's the same object? Or has it become a different object? What would make it the same or what would make it different? Some uh, students I've had in the past will say, well, you know, um, because it has a new engine, then it's a new car. But others will say, well, no, it's still the same truck, even if it has a new engine. Well, where do we make the cutoff point? You know, what about if I had a new frame? Does that make it a new car or truck? Um, give it new wheels. Um, if 90% of the car is new parts, does that make it a new truck? 80%, where do we make the cutoff point? So these are interesting questions about identity, and they're not just about objects that we see around us, but think about this. How do we talk about ourselves and our own existence? So is it true that Bruno Mars might have become a philosophy professor? So in, when we're talking about modality and possible worlds and possible circumstances, is there another universe where Bruno Mars became a philosophy professor? Is that a possible uh, world? Is that a possibility, right? But what about if I ask, well, is it true that Peter G. Hernandez might have become a philosophy professor? Is that possible? Well, you might ask yourself, well, wait a minute, who's Peter G. Hernandez? I know who Bruno Mars is, but I'm not familiar with Peter G. Hernandez. Except if I were to tell you, they two different names, but they designate the same individual. So, of course, uh, the person we call Bruno Mars was not born with the name Bruno Mars. He was later developed that name. He was given the name Pierre Jean Hernandez. But notice, this is the kind of tricky thing about metaphysics, is that even though we have different labels, we're calling it the same. We're, we're identifying the same object, right? The same person. So what are we saying is true here? We might be saying that it's the same person, but wait a minute, if you could point out, well, he's a philosophy professor, he's not an entertainer, he's not a musician. How is he the same person? So these are deep questions. What, what makes that same, uh, what I guess fixes his identity? What makes him uh, the same, even if he changed different professions? Or you can even think about yourself in this matter, right? Um, if you change your name, are you a different person or are you the same person? If you changed your hair, are you the same person? Let's go a little bit further and think about even further extreme. If you had plastic surgery, are you the same person? If you had a heart transplant, are you the same person? Take it even further, and this is where our philosophers, right? What about if all the cells in your body changed. Does that make you the same person, right? So you lose cells, but they, you know, fall off and die. But if all the cells fall off and they change and with new cells, then do we have the same body or are we a new person completely? Um, so we can't seem to understand change without some sort of persistence, right? Saying, well, I know it changes, but something has to stay the same in order for me to compare, right? And so interpreting necessary and contingent uh, identities, right? That's the same too. As I said, well, where does your identity fit? Um, are you the same person in all universes? Or is it a completely different person, right? Because they have a different name, hair, job, 
uh, brain, what makes them the same or different? So these are things that we're going to look into. Unfortunately, we couldn't cover all this stuff that's great, and I love all these philosophers and their different takes on what makes you you. Uh, some are going to approach it from a psychological perspective. They're going to say, look at the person's psychology, look at their memory, look at their uh, experiences. That's what makes you you. Um, the personal narrative, this is why the story that I have on myself, that's what makes me me. Um, but some are going to point out that, well, wait a minute. It can't just be you in your personal psychology that makes you. Aren't you affected by your culture? Aren't you affected by your society? So some philosophers, like Simone de Beauvoir, have said, well, you know, it's your gender and how we identify ge uh, our individual's gender is really influenced a lot by soul, by society and culture. And you can't just think about it as a part of the brain. And then what we'll look at, in particular, uh, the reading, our next reading is going to be about Thomas King. And King has a really great um, sort of approach to identity. He's going to say that identity is a personal narrative. It's a story that we tell ourselves of who we are. It's our life that we have in our mind. But it's place in a social context. So he's kind of combining both sides and saying, you know, how we relate to others makes us who we are. So let's start with Socrates and Plato. Now, who were Socrates and Plato? Well, Plato, of course, he mentioned is a philosopher. Socrates is a philosopher, or so we think. So the way it's kind of understood historically is that Plato is Socrates' student. So Socrates comes first, and then Plato learns from Socrates. And then Plato teaches Aristotle, but they disagree. Um, but the truth is, is that we don't have any first-person account of Socrates. We don't have a book written by Socrates. What we have in set, instead is secondhand sort of information of Socrates. So when Plato writes his stories, he includes these stories about Socrates. He includes so Socrates as a character in his philosophy, in his stories. So did Socrates really exist or not? We're not quite 100% sure. But we're pretty sure that Plato existed because he wrote these stories. So you can see here the School of Athens. It's a really famous mural, and I had the privilege of uh, seeing it first in person uh, in the Vatican. It's actually, if you, if you go to the Vatican, uh, inside the Vatican, interesting enough, where the Pope lives, right, and Catholicism is the home of Catholicism, they have this huge mural painted by Raphael of all the great uh, Greek and Roman philosophers and it's called the School of Athens. And in the middle there, Socrates is uh, Socrates and Plato, and then there's Aristotle. And see, everybody's there. Um, but why would you have all these great philosophers painted and kind of celebrated inside? supposedly one of the holiest places for Catholicism, right? The Vatican. Well, a lot of the history of Christianity and Catholicism is intertwined with philosophy. And we'll start to see that. So Socrates, well, when was Socrates alive? If he was alive, he was alive around the years of seven, uh, 470 to 399 BC. So uh, this is before Jesus, right? And there's this famous uh, painting you can see at the Metropolitan Museum in New York. Uh, it's called The Death of Socrates. So there's a spoiler alert. He's going to die. Um, and it's really important how he dies. He becomes a bit of a martyr uh, because he's seeking the truth or others want to hide from the truth. And so you see there him in the painting is depicted that he's 
uh, going to take the hemlock, which is the poison. That's how they administer the death penalty back then. And those are his followers telling him, no, don't do it. They're very upset. Uh, it wasn't a fair trial. Um, the death sentence he got, they believe, wasn't fair. Uh, so, but Socrates still professes that it's important that he goes through with this. And we're going to read some of his stories later by Plato and see why he's going to go through with this, despite it not being a fair trial according to his followers. So what Socrates really wants to discover here is the essential nature of things. So things like knowledge, justice, beauty, goodness, virtue, um, like courage, what really makes something just? What really makes something beautiful? What really makes something good? And not so much just give me examples of it. Maybe I can point to something. Oh, this person is really knowledgeable. Or this person seems really fair. But he wants to know, well, what is the true nature of something that's of knowledge? What is the true nature of justice itself? And this is what he uses, what we call the Socratic method or the dialectical method. It's a way of asking questions to get to the truth. And I've noticed some students, some people think, well, when they read Plato, it's like, oh, he seems like a know-it-all, or he seems like, uh, oh, he knows the answer, but he just doesn't want to say. Where that's one interpretation, but you can also have another interpretation where, you know, you say, well, he's just kind of a curious guy. He wants to know, and so he's going to ask, but sometimes people don't know the answer. They're not sure what answer to give. And they get really kind of defensive about it, self-cautious about it, because they're like, well, I don't know everything, but I don't want to look kind of stupid or dumb. So they feel really uncomfortable. Now, Plato is the one who writes kind of the account of, the, of his teacher, right? Socrates, as he goes through these trials and tribulations, but Plato is not his, speaking of like a Bruno Mars sort of Peter G. Hernandez situation, uh, Plato is not uh, his original name. His original name is Aristocles. Plato is a nickname that he gains because it uh, supposedly means broad-shouldered. So he was a big guy, big muscular guy, um, just for you to know. And so when he's writing these stories, one of his major stories, one of his major books is The Republic. And we're going to talk about this one more when we get into political philosophy. Um, as you might have remembered from high school or something, um, we usually credit Greek and Athens, the city of Athens, and Greek society is developing democracy, right? Coming up with democracy. But Plato is not a fan of democracy. He doesn't really like democracy. And what we mean by democracy is I think it's something a bit different than what we call democracy today in the United States. What Plato was talking about when he's talking about democracy is that truly everyone gets a vote, and that's how all these decisions are made. But then Plato has a problem with that. He says, well, wait a minute. If everybody gets a vote and all the decisions are made by all these people doesn't what happens if it becomes a popularity contest what happens if people just vote for it because they all like this person better than the other person but it's not because they're actually a good leader is that really fair is that really just is that the society we want to live in where we just vote for people because one's more popular than the other is that how we're going to make decisions so plato talks about this kind of society instead of a democracy, what happens if we have a republic instead, where we have knowledgeable people represent us? So we send somebody a representative, and this is why we kind of have a combination of both systems, the Democratic Republic of the United States. We elect somebody who's going to represent us, who, who should know about the issues, and they're going to work ideally, right, for everybody's issues. They're going to try to help us out not help themselves out, which is 
something that we're going to talk about again, <laughs> political philosophy. But what um, Plato was talking about is this story, this one part of his book uh, regarding the cave allegory. And this is where s the characters are Socrates and uh, Glycon. And they're friends and they're talking together. Now, this is something I tell my students all the time, every semester uh, since I started teaching. How many times should you read this story? Some people will say, well, I'm just going to glimpse through it real quick and then I'm sure I'll get it. What you'll find out is that the way Plato wrote is kind of hard to understand for us now. We talk in a very different way. We understand stories in a very different way. So it might be a little bit tough to kind of grasp. So this is what I was taught. These are the kind of suggestions that I were given and I want to pass on to you. How many times should you read a uh, philosophy paper to really get a good understanding of what's going on? Five times at least, minimum. More is even better. Well, why? Because the first time you will read it, right, you might not get anything. It's like, what is this guy talking about? Who are these people? What is this whole story about? I don't get it. And that's okay. It's completely okay. You don't have to do it the first time. Uh, I still do this with very difficult, complex papers that I read. Like, wait a minute, I didn't get all that. I'm going to have to read this again. So when you read it the second time, then you start, okay, kind of get what they're saying. But when you read it the third time, that's when you start to identify the structure. Oh, okay, now I see they're going to start off the story this way. They're going to lead to the point here, and then they're going to conclude here. Then you start, the pieces starting to fall into place. And then the fourth time you read it, that's when you get your pencil, you're reading it. That's where you can mark, you know, put a star or asterisk or whatever. This the part was important. This paragraph is really important what he's saying here. And so when you go over it the fifth time, notice you don't have to start it all the way from the beginning again. You highlight, you already took a little star or pencil or whatever put it there and said, hey, this is an important part. Go to those parts. That's where you start taking notes. That's where you start really paying attention and putting it together so you remember. And so this is why I highly recommend doing this process. It's going to be a, make it a lot easier for you to understand and really get a good grasp and be able to answer questions that I'll be asking. So a little bit of a background still again. Because I really want you guys to get a full scope of what the story is about. When for Plato, he has a particular view of metaphysics, a particular view of reality. And so what I want you to do with your pencil and paper right now, hopefully you're taking notes as you're watching this lecture, right? Draw a circularity on a piece of paper real quick for yourself. What do I mean by circularity? Take what you mean by Take your interpretation of what I mean by circularity and put it on paper. Now, what does that look like? Well, let's say maybe you drew a circle, right? That's what I was talking about, circularity. So you drew a circle. Is it a perfect circle? Maybe not. Even if you're a really good artist, maybe it's a little bit off or something, right? Well, what is a perfect circle? Have you ever seen a perfect circle? It's like, well, yes, this cup, again, right? It's my favorite prop. It's perfectly circular, right? So, wow, well, if you look at it really under a microscope, it's not that perfect, right? Well, is there anything that you can see with your eyes that's absolutely perfect, is in the form of a circle? Plato's going to say no. But you know that there's such a thing as a perfect circle, but you've never seen it with your physical eye. You've never seen it physically, right? Well, how do you know that? This is where Plato is going to argue. Don't trust your senses. Your senses don't tell you the truth. The senses mislead you. They think you look at something, you think it's real, or you think it's perfect, and it's not. You're going to have to go beyond that. 
and you're going to go out to the world of the forms. So what he means by the forms is the perfect circle, the perfect form, perfection itself. That's where the real reality is. So what we function on, and this is where modern psychology kind of comes in, right? We assume by looking at things that we know what we're seeing. But if you've never seen this particular optical illusion before, you may have not known that the two individuals, right, whatever these creatures are, whatever they are, right in the hallway, they're the same size. But doesn't one look bigger and smaller versus the other? So what figures are They're actually the same size, but our brain is telling us, our visual system tells us something different, right? So can we always trust what we see? Maybe not. And this is, I think, Plato's, uh, one of Plato's major points he's trying to make here is that we need to question sometimes our reality. We need to look beyond and think with our minds and not just rely on our senses to tell us the truth. Because ultimately he's looking for the truth, right? So this is where the allegory of the cave comes in, and you'll see this in the paper. He talks about, when he's trying to explain this, that don't just trust your eyes, don't just trust your senses, don't just go by appearances, look deeper. He starts telling this story of this individual, right? And say, well, imagine there's this individual and for his entire life, he's been chained to this wall underground in a cave. He's never been outside. Um, he's never seen the sun. He's never seen the sky. He's All he's seen is what's been presented in front of him. So he can't move. He can't even move his head either. He can't, because when he's chained to the wall, these these other people who are chained as well. And so everybody's forced to look straight and no one can see each other. But I guess they can hear each other, right? They can talk to each other. And they're presented with these shadows, these images, right? And they're told or it's presented to them that these are the reality. So that's a real horse. That's a real vase. That's what reality really is, is these shadow things. So if that's all you've ever seen in your entire life, you would go, well, yeah, I guess that's what a horse is, right? Whatever I'm seeing in front of me, whatever they're telling me. But one day he's able to get out of the chains and he starts looking towards a deeper light, not the light of the fire that casts the shadows, but he starts to notice there's a brighter light, which we, of course, know is the sun. So he kind of, starts climbing towards that brighter light and he gets out and for the it's blinding actually it's actually a really painful experience for him and if you know right if you've been inside all day and you walk out and it's really sunny you're kind of blinded too you, you can't see but this is an allegory here he's trying to give you a message right he's trying to get you to see that there's a deeper sense sometimes to see the truth you're going to have to go through some discomfort right it's going to hurt a little bit before you start to see what's real. And when the man gets out of there and he sees and he looks at the sky, he says, wow, this is what I've been missing. This is reality, right? He gets so excited that he goes back down to the cave and he's like, hey, guess what? There's this real larger reality outside of this cave. What you're looking at is just shadows. It's not real. And what is the reaction by the individuals? Do they join him? Do they get excited? Actually, no. They come as crazy. They tell him, oh, you've ruined your eyes. You don't understand anything more. You sound crazy. Because they've never experienced anything else. They can't imagine that, you know, there is anything else. And this is kind of what Plato is trying to communicate in his story through Socrates and, and what's going on, is that to really see reality, to really see the truth of everything, you're going to have to go beyond what you know or experience 
and sometimes it's going to be uncomfortable and this is what philosophy does we were trying to find out the truth and dig a little bit deeper so a way to think about this is what called what we call the divided line is that the analog the allegory of the cave is kind of like when he sees the sun right um for Plato, he thinks about it as the good. This is what good is itself. So the visual, this is the world, the objects and states of mind. This is how you how you see in your mind and what the objects are. This is how what Plato is kind of trying to describe. The visible world at the very bottom are images. And what do you do with images? You imagine things. So it's completely untrue. It's like a dream or something, right? You just imagine this magical unicorn or some magical beast or something like that. But there's no real physical reality to it, right? It's just an image that you have in the mind. Now, what we mean by actual things are things that we start, we can touch, right? So we have beliefs about this. Well, I believe this is a cup. I believe this can hold water, things like that. But remember, I said, don't always trust the appearances, right? We saw the painting, we saw the optical illusion. How do I know it's really a cup? How do I know it was going to hold water if it looks like it, right? Maybe you could say I just test it out. But how do I talk about something in the more general sense? How do I know cups hold water, not just this particular cup? How, how do I figure out how much water it can hold, right? I want to get a little bit more precise. That's when we start using math, right? We start using circumference. We start thinking about volume. Those, that's where Plato thinks you're really thinking. You're really starting to actually understand what's going on and not just using your eyes to kind of measure it out. Because sometimes, right, especially like I think a good example of this is like beer uh, glasses uh, or even uh, if you go to a convenience store uh, they've had those things with like different cup sizes. It looks completely different. Like one looks much larger than the other, but then when they pour it into each other, you see what well, holds the same amount, right? One just looks bigger than the other. It's that kind of optical illusion. And so even when you get past that, what's even more concrete than, you know, the mathematical object of a circle, right, or circumference or something, is the circle itself, circularity, right? So that's how we know the perfect circle is there, is that circularity has to be there, the perfect. How do we know that? Well, we use math, right, to help us, and then we make physical things, kind of mimic that, and we imagine things that look like that, but to get all that, we have to first have the form itself. And that's where we really can say we know something. So to really say you know circularity is to know something that doesn't change. This is key for Plato. The truth of reality is that it won't change. Those are the necessary truths. Those are the truths that will always be the case. So we're going to use pi, right? to figure out um, the circumference of the cup or something like that. Those numbers, see the mathematics, the way the formulas are going to use to do that are not going to change, even if I change the cup, right? I might change the numbers a little bit because we have to measure it differently, but the formulas that I'm using to measure stuff are going to stay the same, right? Like the Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared that's not going to change, you know? So this is what Plato's talking about when he's talking about going beyond the visible world, okay, and getting out and seeing what's really real for him, ultimately what's true goodness, what's true knowledge, what's true beauty, what's true intelligence. That's what he's talking about, and that's what he's talking about, love and becoming. So we're going to talk about this towards the end. It's giving you a little bit of a preview, because when Plato talks about love, he's saying you're becoming that thing. 
This is where we get to ontology. No longer are you separated or you're matching a thing. When you truly um, love, let's say, knowledge, you become knowledgeable. When you truly love justice, you become justice. This is why I'm kind of leading to this joke, uh, uh, Superman, Man of Steel, if you ever saw that movie from 2013. Um, I saw it in the theaters and I was kind of laughing and joking with my philosopher friends. You notice that the uh, young Superman, right? Ford becomes a superhero, you know. He's a kid, he's getting bullied. But if you take a look at what he's reading, he's reading Plato, he's reading the Republic. Because if Superman is going to be perfect, right? So he's Superman, then he needs to know what perfection is. And that is why he's reading Plato. He's going to become perfect. He's going to become more than just a regular human being, right? He's going to become something above that. So we'll talk about that in a bit, but later in the, in the course. But you see that uh, when you truly love something, you become it. And that's what Plato's talking about. And this is really affected, and this is a side mention, but this has really affected us. And I said, influence Christianity a lot because figures like Plotinus, who was considered a Neoplatonist, this is after Plato passes away and there's other philosophers, he's saying, you know what? I really agree with what Plato's talking about. But maybe instead of good, what about if we said God was the most perfect thing? Well, how would I know God? I couldn't just represent it physically, right? This is why Plotinus didn't really like statues of himself or anything. He says, that's not really who I am. You're looking at the physical thing. You're not looking at the soul or who I really am, right? And that's not physical. So before Christianity, he had this idea that God was something that was perfect and that uh, was beyond the physical and something you couldn't see physically, something you couldn't experience physically, but something you would have to know through um, individually. But there's kind of a little bit of a, a little bit of a cheat here. Before for Plato, you had to know your mathematics. You had to learn your mathematics so you know or really think and study and be educated to learn. But Titus was like, well, actually, maybe you could just kind of skip all that math and education and maybe you could just know God just by knowing him and without any of that sort of messy education stuff or studying or anything like that. And this influences St. Augustine later, um, after Jesus, when Christianity starts to become popular and he's like, exactly. I like Plotinus, I like Plato, I think that's what we're talking about when we talk about God. Something that's beyond the physical, something that is you would have to learn and know about, but not in the regular studying sense of it. So this is where a lot of, like I said, Greek philosophy influences Christianity uh, and their ideas. So there's some interesting connections here to think about. So notice, talking about metaphysics right now, we covered a lot of different stuff. We covered about logic, um, what makes sense, what's possible, what's not, what has to be, what can't be, right? Uh, epistemology, which we'll talk about more in depth in the next section, but uh, epistemology is about knowledge. How do we know, right? Science, which I look, philosophy of science, which I work in, is, you know, well, how do we think about science? What can science tell us? What can science not? Ethics, which we're not going to get too much into because I, I teach ethics. That's a separate course I teach. But definitely it always, it always comes up because it's relevant. How do we know right from wrong? Is that something we can see? Is that something we have to think about? Uh, religion, which we got a little bit into and personal identity finally. What makes you you? What makes this cup that thing? What makes God that thing? You know, how do we work out those deeper issues?